right. Happy late morning to everybody here. How's everybody doing? Still, uh, still awake and, and, and thriving with energy? Uh, before we get started, I wanted to thank the uh, College of Business for this opportunity and, and all the wonderful folks that were responsible for putting this together. Our Master of Ceremony, Dean Neymar, uh, Lisa Littlejohn, who uh, dealt with a lot of back and forth on our end to get uh, all this uh, great stuff uh, set up, and then Dr. McHenry as well. Um, uh, very, uh, very privileged to be here, so thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to get into a presentation here that talks a little bit about informatics and what informatics is is you know we've heard a lot about how you take data analyze data and put it into dashboards that people can analyze visualize etc I'm going to take a next step and say that's wonderful I'm a firm believer that the dashboard is dead and I'll get to why the dashboard's dead uh, here in the future because the way that people are consuming information is changing rapidly. People have a shorter attention span. They're looking for information on demand when they need it to be able to make critical business decisions. So in my role within the organization and the teams that I represent, a lot of what we try to do is imagination. How can we ima imagine the impossible and solve problems for the business by leveraging all the tools and the information that we have at our disposal? So. Um, I do work in sports entertainment, and a lot of people say it seems like it's a glamorous job, and I always say, well, we're not digging ditches, but it's still work, right? Uh, in, the, in the business of sports, um, you know, there is the business side, which is the standard business operations you, you would see in your traditional uh, corporations or a business. Uh, you've got your marketing arms, you've got your sales arms, you have your business intelligence arms, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's the basketball operations side, which is where they focus on the strategy, the player development, and uh, everything that goes into the product that you would see on the court. I sit on the uh, business side of, of the sports, uh, so I um, want to make a very clear kind of separation between the two because that's a question I get asked a lot. So very quickly, I, I appreciate the, the introduction as well. Um, I think what's important here, uh, it's my 10th season for the Cavaliers. And when I joined the organization, I came in as the vice president of digital and web, uh, web products. And my job was to transform the digital platforms from being a PR mouthpiece to a, uh, a revenue driving channel for the organization. So after four years, we went from about $600,000 in revenue to almost 7 million. Uh, they transitioned me over as we started to go through the process of digital transformation to really focus on cementing our stack and thinking about ways to evolve the business while leveraging technology. My background, uh, I get asked this a lot. I, I'm a, I don't want to say a self-proclaimed unicorn, but I am a pretty unique individual that has fallen into this role, role based upon my experience. Um, I have a deep uh, background in broadcast and production, but I was coming up at the time in which the internet was coming online. So having to learn how to handle production online and programming at that period of time, there was a great opportunity to do that. And over time as I evolved, I became a product owner or a product um, you know, director, being able to define and build products for uh, both uh, the plain dealer, uh, at, at the time, uh, advanced internet, and eventually moved uh, over to Fox Sports where I spent a number of years uh, working both regionally and for their corporate arm before landing back at the Cavaliers in 2013. I like to think that LeBron, uh, you know, was uh, was excited to come back and join Mike Conley at the Cavaliers when he decided to come back in 2014, but the reality is it was just a uh, footprint of having the opportunity to be there a year before LeBron came back and seeing the big spike to the business that took place. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, the overview. Uh, I think it's also incredibly important to understand the structure of how, you, uh, how teams are set up to try to handle digital transformation. Um, there is the traditional sense that uh, you're looking at your analytics and, and your business intelligence group sits with your analysts, your, your uh, data scientists, et cetera. While we believe in that, I think it's also important to look at the bigger picture, and I'll show you a, a structure, an organizational structure and chart here. It is a, is a marriage between your business intelligence group, your information technology teams, data operations and development operations that really make everything click and being able to solve problems for the business. And then we're going to talk about some fun stuff and looking at use cases, which is uh, highlighting how we productize the data to be able to solve problems internally for the organization. This is the structure I was talking about. When I joined the organization uh, back in uh, 2013, there were three people that were on our IT, uh, Information Technology Group, and we had uh, two individuals that were on our IT support team. At the time, our business intelligence group had three people, and we've evolved now to be over almost 35 people in total uh, across all these different departments. 
valuing the number of threes, I'll, I'll highlight uh, the, the same concept here. We've got our business intelligence group. We've got our product and technology that has development operations that sits underneath it. And then we have data operations. Data operations was kind of the secret component that unlocked our ability to really advance and meet the needs of the business on a day-to-day -day basis, where we have a team that just focuses on normalizing the data, deduping the data, structuring it, handling our API development, both inbound and outbound, and also being able to uh, work directly with the analysts to be able to deliver data sets that they need across the way that we store that internally. Uh, here are the different disciplines uh, that sit within each of these individual groups. Our business intelligence group focuses on your daily reporting and analytics, uh, primarily around the uh, elements of ticketing, food and beverage, retail, um, partnerships, and business operations. Um, data visualizations, dashboarding, even though I did say dashboarding is dead, we still do provide it in the means, but I get to some metrics about how people consume that a little bit later. And then uh, we also have an advanced analytics, uh, analytics arm that sits within our business intelligence group that focuses on a lot of the advanced data modeling, the machine learning, and eventually starting to leverage some of the AI capabilities that come out of that uh, programmatic approach to automation. Our data operations, uh, schematic design, ETL development, API development, uh, data governance, uh, CRM management, quality assurance, and workflow management. Uh, boy, anybody that's had to manage workflows across an organization knows how wonderful of a job that is. Uh, you're basically the one that has to uh, ruin everybody's day by telling them they have to follow a process when nobody likes to follow red tape. Um, and then our development operations, uh, front-end, back-end development, uh, third-party integrations, and then internal and external product development and maintenance, as well as application support. So those main three pillars are what are driving the digital transformation for the organization. What's really, really important is the mission statement for the teams that are represented here. Our mission statement is we are a team for others. We are not here to be the smartest group within the organization that has all the answers to everybody's problems. We are there to help solve the problems by aligning technology and information to be able to advance the business. And it is a true partnership and a collaboration with the other important elements of the business that has allowed us to grow and build the trust amongst everybody. So it doesn't matter if we think we've got the best idea, if the business does not have a problem that's tied to that, we've got a solution without an answer. So let's get into some use cases here. Uh, whale watching. Um, the, the business problem we had, uh, our member reps came to us and say, hey, you know, I've got all these accounts that I'm trying to track, and some of our member reps have you know, 35 to, in some cases, 150 different accounts that they're managing. And they wanted to know specifically when their ticket holder checked in for an event. They wanted to know when they were in the building so they can prepare to go and either say hello to them, cut them off of the past, deliver them a beer, or maybe their favorite spirit, et cetera. And they wanted to know um, where they were located at inside of the field house. So if you think about that, you've got this, this identity opportunity, and then you have this location opportunity that you have to solve for. And most importantly, they didn't want to have to proactively open up their computer to get that information. So. We were presented with that problem, and the solution we came back with was what was called whale watching. And the reason why whale watching, you know, right, when you watch whales, you sit out in the ocean for a long period of time and wait for that one moment where you can see the, the big whale come out of the water. These are the biggest, you know, most important accounts that were tied to this rep. So within Salesforce, I know we've got some Salesforce reps here, um, we uh, built this component uh, that allowed all of our member reps to subscribe for notifications when their members came in. And our first iteration of that would send out either an email or a text message to the individuals directly to the cell phone when they had opted in for those notifications. And it would be regardless of the event. So if we had an event that was at the field house or if we had an event that was out uh, you know, at a museum, et cetera, they would get that information directly to their cell phone. What ended up happening after that is, well, that's great. I got notified about it, but I didn't see the text notification until five minutes after the individual came into the building. Well, the way that we solved for that problem is we did a lookup after we delivered, or before we delivered the text notification to see if the individual, based upon who would, who would uh, come into the venue, their email address was on Wi-Fi. And if they were on Wi-Fi, we had real-time location services built into the wireless network inside our facility that allows us to triangulate their detail for their location within three feet of accuracy inside the facility. So if the individual opened up the text message after um, you know, five minutes later, it would show them a triangulation for where the last location they were off of the access point inside the field house. 
So this started off as a test and has become a, a really uh, highly adopted product across um, our teams, not only on just the sales side, but our executives use this so we can provide the best possible customer service. And all this came through off of ideation and exploring the possible of what is possible by leveraging technology. And these are the things that really make a difference in being able to build the trust between you know, the business side and what you can bring to the table from a technology perspective. So heading into All-Star uh, 2022, we were uh, fortunate to be able to host uh, the All-Star game this last February. And what was great is the Cleveland weather cooperated very well with us. It was a balmy 12 degrees, I believe, during that weekend, or the coldest weekend we had all winter. Um, but our corporate partnership team came to us and said, listen, we, we, we've got a problem. The enterprise ticketing solution that we use, which runs SeatGeek, and we also have access ticketing. We've got two separate platforms. They're, they're too complex for smaller events. I, I don't need to go through the process of building a manifest and doing all these things and then having to log into the back end to track some of these things. And more importantly, what they're providing back to us on the ticketing side isn't really catered for a partner to understand, you know, did somebody show up to a meeting? Can, can I assign a ticket for somebody to show up to a meeting while we're off site? So, uh, and the customer experience around all of that is not really catered for business purposes as much as it is fan facing on the other end. So, um, and also lacked intelligence and reporting. So our team um, that uh, focuses on our Salesforce uh, CRM development, as well as our data operations group and our development, uh, development operations team, built a lightweight ticketing platform that integrated directly into Salesforce by leveraging a platform called PassKit. And what PassKit does is it allows um, all of our member reps to go in and click uh, with a, a button within CRM that says, I, this individual is going to get invited to an all-star event day um, uh, meeting that's going to be at this place off of the location because we didn't have the field house at the time. The NBA comes in and takes over the field house during that period of time. So we were off site. And it would then pre-populate uh, a ticket that would get emailed directly to that individual that allowed them to pull that down to their wallet. And at that point in time, we had details in advance of knowing who was going to show up and who was actually delivered an invite, who had downloaded the actual uh, tickets, uh, in this case, mobile wallet ticket, directly to the phone. And it allowed us to prepare and forecast for the expectations of the amount of people that were going to be in these areas before we got to the events. So simple things like ordering the amount of food that we needed for that type of event. We didn't have a ton of overage in which we were worried about throwing away a bunch of food. We can also prepare all of the merchandising we were going to provide our partners as they were coming on site. So very, very tactical management operationally, being able to know how to plan accordingly. But then more importantly, when people started to come into these events, you had the whale watching capability to subscribe so you were notified. But then we also had a dashboard running in real time that showed us who showed up based upon who was invited, how they skewed demographically, who they were related to through a graph database. So if they had other connections for people within their own community, and our corporate reps then were very well prepared to be able to have meaningful conversations to do great business uh, during a really important weekend for us across All-Star Weekend. And while this started off as a, an event-based solution just for our partnership team, we have now scaled this for our job fairs at the, the field house uh, for potential candidates are coming in. We've used this for other events that we've hosted there. It's become kind of a, a mainstay for how people start to manage the opportunity around their smaller events. BizBot. You know, there's been a lot of uh, discussions around you know, these, these bot-based uh, products and platforms that uh, allow you to send a query to something and get a response back. And I think 1-800-Flowers was one of the first to do this many years ago with Facebook. And you know, it got a lot of great attention in the beginning. And then all of a sudden, people started to re realize the decisioning tree and all the data that had to sit underneath that to start to make really important um, decisions off of these queries that came in. So like anything, uh, you like to think you're casting a very wide net to solve for every possible question that comes in. But the reality was uh, it became very difficult to, I think, build a fan-facing business application in that way because of the sheer scale of the type of questions you would get. So what we decided to do, um, because the business came to us and said, listen, I'm tired of dashboards. I, I, I don't want to have to drill into my uh, email, open up an application, drill down into the application to find what my, my, uh, you know, my report looks like. I want to have this information on demand when I want it. 
So we said, okay, we're going to go back and uh, we're going we're to figure out a way that we might be able to automate this for you. And then they threw a separate curveball, as God bless my data governance, you know, lead. He came over and said, well, you know, there's a lot of information we've got on our data stack that is probably not the best to expose to everybody across the organization. So we need to put administrative privileges across the board based upon group policies that are sitting within Active Directory. And then on top of that, they wanted to make sure that it was locked down to only the phones that were issued by the company back to the team member that sat on our Verizon plan. So those were the three problems that we had to try to figure out. And as a result, we went, uh, we're an AWS development shop, so a lot of our development sits in AWS. We went and looked at the Lex framework and the Lex protocol. So the same thing that you use at home for Alexa. When you're asking Alexa a question, Alexa, what's the temperature outside? And she comes back with that really robotic voice and tells you what it's like. Well, that framework also translates to be able to do natural voice translation or natural text translation. So they're called invocations. So we defined a list of invocations in which we were able to create. And in that process, we worked with each individual business unit to say, what type of information would you want to know when and, and when you want to need it? And when do you want to need it? Excuse me. So things like drop count. You know, I want to know how many tickets we've distributed for tonight's event. I want to know how many people have showed up for tonight's event based upon uh, how many tickets were distributed. I, I want to know what our diversity spend looks like. I want to know who that team member's manager is. I want to know the relationship between this team member and the other individuals that they've brought into the building for tonight's event. So you can see all these ideas started to cascade in. And for us, it was really simple. We had a uni unified data set that sat across the board that we were able to build these layers of um, you know, uh, detail that we could deliver back off of these queries or these invocations as they call them. And it took a little bit of time to massage the, uh, the output, right? You know, you have to make sure the data that you're extracting and inserting into these statements become legible and make sense. But that was probably the hardest part for us, is just saying, okay, we can, retri we can retrieve the information, but then we have to add the natural, you know, I guess syntax of that detail for the individual to be able to consume. Now we get a ton of invocations a day off of this where people are using this out in the field, inside the venue, and it's just another way to deliver information quickly into the hands of our, our business users when they need it. So real-time event day hub. Um, a lot of discussion today around analytics has probably been more focused on record of truth, 24 hour after the fact of this detail coming in. Anybody that's worked in this space that has, to, has had to deal with streaming data understands the complexity of what streaming data brings to your ability to try to visualize that with accuracy. And what the, uh, th this came from our CEO. He wanted to make sure that at any point in time we had real-time awareness around you know, the, uh, the amount of tickets that were out there for a given event, what the people flow looked like for people coming into the venue, what's the average time they had, um, what, what type of our entries are going to be blocked up, where can we start to move people left and right, uh, and wanted to know the state of food and beverage and retail sales. And the details had to be available on a mobile device, and they also had to be able to be delivered through our IPTV system, which is the dashboarding that we did, you know, more visually on our displays inside our, our admin offices. So that low latent stream of data, when you go to the endpoints for those, you're pulling directly from an API that's coming out of your point of sale. There is no ETL that's coming out that's going to put it into a structure for you that's going to allow you to then pull that back in, because this has to be immediate. So as this information comes in, there's a ton of testing you've got to do to make sure it's reliable. But the hardest part in all of this is the back-end systems that you're dealing with often don't have friendly names. They've got these really, you know, more technical-based names that you're pulling from in regards to your fields and the naming convention. So you have to build lookup tables that translates a more complex term to a simple, you know, uh, consumable term that can be then pushed into a, an event day dashboard. So we leverage Kinesis shards and streams to do this. I know there's Kubernetes and others that, that focus on containerizing these things with, with real-time streaming data. But now we can deliver this information within three seconds of any scan or this detail that's taking place inside our venue. So it's from point of sale, it's from our food and beverage platform, and it's also from our ticketing platform and sensors that we have around the venue. And so now the CEO doesn't have to come to us and say, hey, you know, hey, BI team, what the heck's going on tonight? You know, I, I'm seeing more crowds that are, I, well, open up your mobile phone, you can see for yourself, right? 
But what's even more important off of this, that's one aspect of it, right? Most people aren't gonna constantly be pulling up their phone in the middle of an event. What we've done is we've built a notification center or a preference center that can go into to subscribe to specific events. When the threshold is met, they get notified that that event has taken place. So a good example of that, our, you know, our booking uh, manager at the, at the field house, she works with promoters all the time. So when a concert comes in, the promoter says, I will not send the main act on stage until we're at 70% capacity. Before, she'd have to have the laptop open, refreshing, refreshing, you know, doing all these things. Now she can go in and subscribe the promoter to actually have a text, you know, notification when that hits. She gets the same notification once that threshold's met, and it's all pulling from the same unified data source. So now the promoter knows exactly when that happens, more efficient trying to get the acts on stage. Again, just a way to try to figure out ways to solve internal problems for the business that creates much better collaboration across the board. Team member dining, uh, you know, supply chain, right? You know, this is, I, I, I liken this to supply chain, but this is more, you know, I guess internal operations as it relates to our food and beverage program. Traditionally, um, each individual business unit within the organization has to use a GL code to assign team member dining to for an event. Everybody that works in sports and entertainment, you work when everybody else is working, and you're also working when everybody else is enjoying themselves. So we offer meals to everybody on event days, so when they come into the field house, they can go down, have a good meal, and get ready to go on to take on the event. The challenge before was each and every one of those were like a, a manual process that would be written in. You'd have to sign your name into a, a piece of paper. That piece of paper would be taken back to sourcing. Sourcing would roll them up, send them over to accounting. Accounting then would manually do it and send it over for uh, a payment to Aramark, who's our food and beverage provider, to do that. So we, every t individual team member already had a digital card for uh, getting discounts at, at the team shop for retail. And we figured since it's already in the mobile wallet and it's already issued to the individual, it ties back to their unique, um, you know, unique uh, employee ID, that we can automate this process and not only automate it, we can make it more efficient. Because in the past, anytime somebody would use a voucher, you would get charged $10 regardless. There was no, no way for them to know, well, they only spent $6 on their meal, but we're, you know, uh, and we're gonna give you $4 back off of this voucher. It was an all or nothing type thing. So we said, okay, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna build this into the digital process and then integrate it into the point of sale. So now a team member goes up to the point of sale, they can go to any concession stand across the field house, they scan their, their barcode for whatever the total is, we get billed back exactly that amount for what it is, we're saving money on the other end, but more importantly, it also allows us to budget better. So we're not having to say, okay, if we're gonna have seven people on an event night, it's gonna be $70, you know, that we're gonna have to pay to be able to cover the, the food and beverage cost. It now comes down to maybe $45. So we're saving money and becoming more efficient than we're, we're trying to track this process. Again, a small win, meeting the needs of many different areas across the organization to be able to build the collaboration. Predictive analytics. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about ML and how do you leverage machine learning for stronger processing to become more predictive about what you do. And we've, uh, we've jumped into this space in several areas and we've been doing this for a while now. Uh, we use SageMaker as kind of the, the back end platform that can help us be able to create these predictive outcomes. Listen, Microsoft has a wonderful product as well, so I don't want anybody to think one's better than the other. Um, but what this allows us to do, and, and this was a, a bit of an epiphany for me, because before you're in this process when, when you're moving into a role trying to lead digital transformation where you feel like you gotta convince everybody that there's, there's a reason for this, right? There's a purpose behind this. We're gonna become better at what we do. It's not just for, for the glitz and glamour. And a lot of people are very skeptical about it because people have their processes, they have their, their intuition, their gut. They've been doing this for a long period of time. And to get anybody to change and cross that chasm to adopt this becomes a real challenge where you're arm wrestling back and forth. You're trying to always what seemed to be prove yourself. So we started this process as more of an internal effort for our team to say, can we get to a point where we can predict our show rate within 3%? Right? And can we do it consistency, consistently with, with accuracy so we can eventually hand this over to the business so they can start to staff accordingly and understand what we're up against? Because what you distribute for a game versus who shows up for a game is very different. And there could be a delta of several thousand tickets, if not up to 8,000, depending on weather and other things that take place. And that can really create a, a really challenging staffing uh, conundrum for you. 
So we started to do this, you know, working with uh, you know, our advanced analytics team, and I started you know, kind of peeking in each day, say, hey, what, what's, what's the prediction today? And we didn't just run one model. We were running eight models, right, and minimizing it down to an aggregate of an average and trying to take the one with the best predictive score. And we got so accurate in this process by running this over and over again. I said, all right, I, I think we're ready to, to hand this over to the business. We did this big presentation to the business, and everybody's kind of looking at us saying, yeah, 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 OK. Well, one night, big snowstorm hits, and we realize, holy cow, this model's showing us that we're going to have a huge reduction in the amount of people that are showing up. Meanwhile, our facility operations team is still staffing at the gills, thinking we're going to have this rush at the doors. And I said, hold on, guys. This model is telling us right now that because of the weather that just hit, we should expect less people coming in over the period of time. Uh, yeah, yeah, OK, sure, we'll see. Yeah, I've heard that before. And sure enough, we're sitting there twiddling our thumbs at the point of ingress, and everybody's like, wow, this is a much lower show rate than we had expected. Immediately after that, every single event, our facility operations lead was pinging me all the time, saying, hey, hey what's that predictive show rate going to be for tonight? They started to buy into this process and almost became like a game between them. We're like, I think it's going to be this. I think it's going to be that. that. That kind of really helped move the adoption along where everybody felt like they had a part in it. But it wasn't easy to get there. Everybody looks at this and saying, I have a better, you know, I have a better understanding based upon my experience to what's going to happen. And sure, intuition and gut is a very important part of that. But this gets you to the point where if you collectively can find the variables you're trying to insert in your model, everybody's on the same page about the value it can bring to the business. All right, so let's get into some fun stuff. I've talked a lot about, you know, some internal business, you know, problem solving that we've done. Uh, these next two are, are really focused on fan-facing solutions that we were, we were building. Um, at the top, I think, of the introduction, it was stated, I, I was responsible for the technology that went into the digital transformation, uh, well, not the digital transformation, but the transformation of the field house that took place back in 2019 when we finished up. And we built what's called the Power Portal. And the Power Portal sits in the Sherwin-Williams entrance, which is our northwest entrance at the front of the building. And it's a 180 degree direct view LED platform that's an immersive tunnel that has this really unique soundscape audio to it. So anybody, by show of hands, has anybody gone through the field house and gone through that? Very, very unique experience. It was the first of its kind, never been built anywhere in the world outside of uh, in Korea with LG that they used OLED TVs to do it. So we built this and we started doing all these really cool animations and our, 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 you know, our animation team absolutely loved having this canvas to be able to showcase their skills because they're used to doing these spots and dot signs and ribbons and stuff. Now they have this beautiful canvas that they can really showcase their skills on. But we, what we realized is like this was really supposed to help shepherd people into the concourse. It was a big welcome area that when everybody came in, it was like, wow, this is really cool. I, I, this is a unique experience I can't get at home. Well, our first Dizzy on Ice event came up, and we couldn't get the kids out of the power portal because they were singing with Elsa and everybody that was running down this, and, and the parents you know, literally sat there for like the first 15 to 20 minutes of the show because their kids were having so much fun in there. So we realized, okay, we have to have a way to, to kind of do this, this really nice meet and greet, but to try to move people along in the process so we're not creating this static environment. And what we realized is we had all this great streaming data that was coming in from ticketing. And what it does is it provides you identity of the individual that's coming in. And is there a way, if we can get this data in a very low latent way, we can pass that along to an application that can render that graphically and welcome people coming into the venue? So if you think about that, you come in, you scan your ticket, you've got about 20 feet before you hit this power portal. So the problem that we had was creating a delay long enough where we knew the person that was scanning their ticket was actually in the presence of the power portal to be able to trigger this welcome message. So every device that comes into our venue has a unique MAC address. That unique MAC address ties is unique to our network, right? So it's, it's, it's not like that same MAC address would go to your network, et cetera. But that MAC address ties back to an email address that gives us the identity of the individual that's coming from the ticket. So leveraging HTML5 and CSS3 applications, we were able to build this experience that sat inside the Power Portal that literally welcomed everybody as they came through there saying, welcome to Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. And uh, members, we were able to put a member badge next to our name to make everybody feel very special. So I've got a quick video here that kind of shows you how it all unfolds from beginning to end.
So a lot of people were like, well, what's the ROI on that? That's really cool, but what's the ROI? Well, the ROI is it gets people out of their house, away from their TVs to come into our venue and buy tickets so they have an experience they can't get anywhere else. It also helps you with, you know, the, the long time value of the fan. It creates more loyalty, it creates a more personalized experience for people that are coming in. And I can tell you, everybody that goes through and has that experience is something they'll never forget. Catching people's first reaction when they see that is, is pretty remarkable. Um, and we're just really scratching the surface on some of the things we can do there. You think about taking that to the next levels of digital signage that we have all throughout the venue. In total, we've got over 950 digital displays throughout our venue. It starts to get more complex when you get clustering involved, but we'll, we'll figure that out down the line here soon. Um, the last piece I wanted to share with you is uh, our CView volumetric video platform. And while this may not be directly analytic related, it is an incredibly complex math problem to solve for. So if you've got mathematicians in, in the crowd here, you'll probably absolutely love this. Um, we partnered with Canon, uh, Canon out of Japan, the, the camera company, um, to install uh, this volumetric video platform inside the field house. We were the first venue in the world to have it. And uh, right now we're one of only two venues along with Barclays that actually has this in place. And we had experimented with this in the past with Intel. Intel had what was called FreeD, and it was supposed to give you this full 360 degree video replay solution that you can use. And I'm sure you've seen it before, they've used it in the NFL and some other areas. The biggest challenge with that, the fastest they can get you that replay was 15 seconds. And by the time that play is done, the immediacy of that window for you to be able to show that and maintain the fans' attention to it is really three seconds, right? Three, maybe four seconds, and then you're moving on to the next piece. So we were always stuck where we couldn't really figure out the best use case to utilize the Intel piece because it was always lagging behind. So we had to create these really artificial features that said, halftime, here's the big you know, replay of the first half. And then everybody thought it was just a replay. There wasn't anything really unique or different about it. So when Canon came to us with a solution, they said, we've solved the latency problem. We can get you this video back within three seconds so you can use it in the context of your broadcast inside the venue. And they were still, these are old broadcast folks that are still thinking about it from a replay perspective. Replay, it's gonna be a great replay opportunity. So we said, okay, we'll do it. And we did it in conjunction with the, uh, the NBA coming in for All-Star Weekend. We put it in place. And what it does, volumetric video in voxels recreates the image of the player that's on the floor and makes it a graphical element. It doesn't re replicate the, the actual video frame of the individual. It takes the silhouette of an object and then it composites voxel details so it almost looks like a video game. And what it does is it provides you six degrees of freedom motion through the process. And what is six degrees of freedom motion? When you're watching a tr traditional broadcast on 2D, somebody is dictating to you what you're going to see based upon their direction. Right? You've got maybe five cameras, you've got a high camera, you've got a you know, courtside camera, you've got all these different you know, prescribed views, but you can't change those views. It is consumed by somebody else dictating to you. The six degrees of freedom motion allows you to utilize things like yaw and XY telemetry to be able to manipulate the way that you look at the actual game in the context of the game. So I've got a video here that will, will show this to you, but what's important is the context of what this leads to. It's not a replay technology, it's going to be a stream that will run simultaneously side by side with your linear broadcast that the folks that want to be immersed into the actual telecast have the ability to jump in there and kind of choose their own adventure. They can choose their angles, they can manipulate the way they're viewing this without to have, having to have a camera operator in place. Because these cameras literally scan the entire bowl and put a coordinate that's in association with every finite square inch of that bowl and every player. So being able to fr freely move throughout the actual playing floor itself is a really, really cool thing to experience. A um, couple, couple things we're still working through on this. There's a little bit of jittering and artifacting that comes in. That's probably the hardest thing to solve for, but we've got it to a point where it's refined and really, really unique. So here's a video that kind of gives you a, a, an overview of uh, what, what's possible here. Love with the half-court pass to Darius Garland, who explodes to the basket for a lefty layup. 
Now let's see that again with your sea view play of the game. Love with the long overhead pass to Garland, who looks off his defender and blows past Rajon Tucker for the easy lay-in. Whoosh, it's like that. Whether it's broadcast, social, or in venue, we offer you the opportunity to most effectively promote your brand, along with the fascinating footage of Seaview. Your message rising above all. Your brand always the center of attention. Put your name around the game. Let's take another look at this play with the Seaview replay. Luca with the ball up top. He gets a screen from Clever and tries to go behind the back as he penetrates, but loses the handle. And RJ Nemhard is there for the steal. Let's look at that again. Luca gets the pick. I thought maybe the defender got a hand on it, but Luca just lost the ball. And a heads up play by RJ to grab the loose ball and get it over to a breaking Karis Levert, who takes it in for the jam. Check out Levert going airborne from the circle. Look at that elevation as he slams it home. Easy two for the Cavs. As you can see here, I, I get the ball here at the top of the key. I got Trey Young on me, a good defender. So I'm trying to create some separation. I use a little jab step here and then I cross over behind my back, which frees me up just enough for the step back three. I knew it was good the second I left my hand. No matter the format, with Seaview, every play is the play of the game. Hanging in the air, the big outside shot. Setting effective screens, always dialed in and ready to play. Seaview, next gen products, immersive media, sponsorship opportunities. It's your game, we just help you live it. And a little bit long of a sizzle reel, but hopefully it provides just some perspective. It's, we've been talking about digital twins, right? It's basically a digital twin of what happens with our product on the floor within three seconds of when it happens. So it opens up the door for us to look at the metaverse and beyond and how we can really start to take the fan experience to another level over time. So thank you very much for allowing me to tell our story and uh, for, for, for having me here today with the, uh, the College of Business. It's, it's been a lot of fun. So uh, we're assembling up here, so I think RJ is going to come back up, and then uh, we're going to have, what I want to do is I want to get them to talk to each other a little bit, as well as uh, making sure that we give ample time for questions uh, from the audience. But since I have the microphone right now, I'm going to ask you what I think is a mind-blowing observation about what you just showed. So if you think about the fact that you have created what, as you say, a digital twin of the game experience, which is available within three seconds of the actual action. And as I understand it, you are giving this to the hands of the fans, right? So a fan is, is going to be able to manipulate the game, see what, uh, what uh, angles they want to see and things like that. So you have effectively turned your real-time game into a real-time video game from which you can then sprout off all sorts of different avenues so that people out there can be playing your game as a video game at the time that the players are actually playing their game. So, you know, if you think about video game in engines, they all have limitations to them by what's been programmed them in advance. Your video game never has any limitations because it's based on the real-time action. So have you talked about this as a possibility of where you're going to go with this technology? Yeah, it's a very, very great way of looking at that through a different lens. You're 100% correct. Like, when we saw this technology, first you're like, okay, we've done this before, and the latency always created challenges for us, where it was going to be a, you know, a complementary aspect to the experience as opposed to something that can run side by side and, and really give optionality to what we traditionally provide to the, to the new, you know, new fan. And once we delved in and started to really trust the engineers from Canon that built these algorithms to be able to get this you know, built and delivered back to us in three seconds, that's where the ideations started to really explode to say, holy cow, 
we have the ability to do this in real time to be able to recreate the a video game element of what you're seeing in real life, but we also are capturing all this data. We've got petabytes of data from last season that we've captured from every single game that we can recreate and reuse. So when you think about the eventual move into the metaverse, and it's happening. I, I know everybody, there's a lot of people that think the metaverse is this, you know, this, this potential, um, you know, uh, snake oil that's out there. It's, it's going to happen, right? If you have kids that are in Roblox now, you're already saying it. All the metaverse does, and especially for venues like ours, 99% of our fans will never step foot in our building. Think about that. We cater to the 1% of fans because those are the ones that buy the tickets, those are the ones that will come in and buy the concessions, but there are 99% of people that will never have that experience. So when we are, have the ability to recreate a digital twin of what the physical fan in our building can experience, now all of a sudden we create a ton of opportunities. So the one replay that you saw with Darius Garland um, you know, dribbling in for the layup, we can literally insert somebody's digital avatar from a metaverse, you know, from a metaverse perspective, into the perspective of that play on the floor and ask them to replicate that process. So they're playing side by side with uh, Darius Garland and trying to, to, to put a layup in the same way, right? So you start to think about the potential engagement and interaction that ha happens there. It brings those fans into another layer of engagement that's gonna create more loyalty and will eventually allow you to sell more merchandise. That can, we, you can start to sell digital ticketing into these environments with things like Unreal Engine 5 where you can do an overlay of digital avatars on a, on a real crowd. So it's um, incredibly exciting, but we're probably, I think, for showtime in that area, we're probably at least three to five years away from getting the full programming set to be able to take what we've captured and be able to introduce interaction and engagement into that environment with somebody else personally controlled avatar. But exciting stuff. So uh, just to follow up on that, I'd like RJ, uh, just tell us to what extent you're drooling over this technology. What would you have done if you had had this technology available to, and in the way that you represented your athletes? When, you know, none of this was was out, right? Because I've been out of sports now for about uh, four years. Uh, but, you know, what was becoming popular um, was the, you know, the um, name image likeness deals for athletes to be on actual video games uh, that were more stagnant looking than this. Um, which was always great because depending again on the athlete and the data we got, the athlete either got a set amount to have their image on, for example, PGA Tour Golf with Tiger Woods, or they got a percentage of the sales for those games. So um, this type of technology, what it can do, how it can create and increase uh, brand profiles for an athlete would be a... Um, I mean, it's a game changer, no pun intended, but it, it truly is in terms of being able to really amp up somebody's, uh, what called the, you know, the Q rating, the, the amount that, uh, that quantifies how recognizable a name, image, or likeness is for an athlete. Uh, let, let me let uh, my co-moderator have one crack at it, and then I'm sure many, uh, if we want to just start putting up some hands, if there are people who have questions, just so that our microphone very able assistant back there can uh, bring that over and hear Susan. Thank you, thank you, Bill. So I, I heard from both of you that there might be a challenge with determining attribution. So attribution with visualization on um, a ball used in play, for example, and attribution of somebody walking in. So how do you balance the, well, we don't really have ROI, to really trying to take all of the solutions that you're working on, even a deal, and, and work it into an attribution model, because I still find that there really aren't some great attribution models out there. And, and is that a- Attribution of revenue. Attribution of an engagement point to, it doesn't have to be revenue, it could be whatever that desired outcome is. Um, so I'm just curious about, do you struggle with that attribution model, and, and do you see what I'm seeing as a marketer, we just struggle with attribution models? That's a really good question, and I'll try to answer it through maybe two different avenues. I think technology has come a long way to help with attribution models. You've got video capture technology on social now that can identify every time a logo pops up with the, without you having to send somebody in to look at every frame of video. And it will score it for you and it will tell you a, a defined media value of what an individual gets. 
I think the challenge that we have now, because we're going through this linear to cord cutting tr transformation, is the, the traditional Nielsen means of reporting are not caught up with where the habits are moving. And I know they're working on it right now. But you still have different types of channels that are reporting in different ways, and all of them have to come together and aggregate as a whole. But the way that I think selling in general and corporate partnership sales are going, and this may even be true for athlete negotiations, et cetera, a lot of that is listening to what they're trying to accomplish and then building a thematic around that with a hub and spoke solution to activate it. And what I mean by that is impressions is great for somebody that's looking for recognition, right? But if you're a well-established brand that doesn't need to have, like McDonald's, everybody sees the arches from McDonald's, right? And sure, there's probably a recall value every time you see those arches to maybe think that you're hungry, but do they value getting those arches out in front just to show the arch as much as they would talk about somebody seeing a, a fish sandwich or eating a fish sandwich? So it's, it's about trying to direct somebody that's going to drive a difference to their business. So if you're looking at like content marketing, you know, the content marketing has been a big part of that in being able to tell the story behind the brand and help them. But it starts very wide at the top of the funnel where you're going to hammer people with the, the impressions and then you refine that all the way down to getting to conversion. And Sports is a great place to do that because you can build those storylines over the course of a season to eventually do the, you know, the high impression engagement all the way down to the activation at the end of the day. I have one more quick question. Um, you do a lot of work with um, just field work, right? People on mobile phones and you're, you're, you do a lot with delivery, mobile delivery of information. And so my question is, do you have UI UX people on your team and, and if so, you know, what is their role? Also, how do they work with you in making these products sponsorable? So, right, so you're delivering information, but maybe there needs to be a logo on there or a tagline. And where do you see the role of UI, UX resources in the future as you continue down this path? I think it's incredibly important. We have an ism um, in our organization that the packaging is just as important as its content. So aesthetically, everything has to look and be very, very clean. Our, our chairman, Dan Gilbert, is incessantly focused on contrast. Like if there's not high contrast on anything, he will, he, he will literally call you in the middle of the night saying, why do you have a gray and a white? You know? So everything has a purpose in the way that he looks at the, his vision and simplicity. And anytime you put something out, whether it be for the business or for the fans, you're going to get judged on it. Right? And if somebody doesn't like the way it looks, but maybe likes the way that it operates, are you going to get the same type of adoption? Probably not. Right? And when you're designing for omni-channel delivery, though, it gets a little tricky because you're trying to use responsive designs and other things, so you're doing one-to-many as opposed to one-to-one -one for each delivery mechanism. And I think, you know, since we've expanded, our front-end developers have worked very closely with our CGX team, our graphics team, to ensure that, you know, we go through a very arduous process from wireframing to being able to do high-fidelity mocks all the way to the product that we, we roll out and we get iterative feedback in that process. So we'll try to get it into the hands of the power users, the ones that will give us strong feedback as opposed to saying, oh, it's great, oh, this is wonderful, and maybe they'll use it, maybe they won't. And then we take that through cycles. You know, We do agile development internally, so within a two-week window, we can change things quickly through our sprint cycles. And you know, all I can tell you is listen to your consumer. They're gonna tell you whether or not what you have is good. And if you're not getting consumption or good feedback, it's probably not. Okay, let's, uh, Thank you. Let's see if there's, let's Questions see. in the audience? Yes. Okay, uh, Deb has a question. Yeah. You want to? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I, I can bring you. The I can use my professor voice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, where do you see the sport analytics as a field from the supply side and the demand side going, heading to? So, you know, I, I know I showed that organizational chart uh, when I started. Um, we've grown substantially in, in that area. And when I say, you know, business and analytics, there's a ton of opportunity across the sports landscape now for data analysts, business analysts, QA analysts, um, and engineers. I mean, you're talking about a, a real kind of renaissance of, of a need for that within the space. Um, what is really, really interesting is sports has to shift the mentality that it's a privilege to work in sports. For years, they thought, okay, well, we can get the best talent because we're a sports team. That's not true, right? There is a ton of competition where everybody's trying to find the top talent to bring them in because they're also trying to do the same exact things. So for us, 
What's really important for us is to build pipelines and relationships with higher ed and other outlets uh, throughout our region that we can start to develop relationships with talent and faculty so we can start to build and evolve the way that we uh, bring value into our business. And we, you know, we've got data stewards now that we've hired that simply sit within our revenue generating areas of the business. Their job is to make sure the input of information is accurate, the workflows are being adhered to, and they've got a dotted line directly back to the analyst they work with, right? And they need to be a very strong personality to be able to fight the bureaucracy on the other side. So when you think about, you know, just the idea of having to be behind a computer or working heads down on focusing on spreadsheets and stuff, that's not true. Like, it is a vital part of the way we do business now, and it's really important on how we make decisions as well. The reliance on this information is making us better at making more informed decisions, and we're seeing that value. So, again, I, I only see it growing. I don't see it going backwards anytime soon. And there's a track for it on the, the, you know, the, the sport operations side, and there's a track for it on, on the business operations side as well. OK, um, over here. <laughs> From an operational perspective, you talked about um, the business side of the Cavaliers. Obviously, there are stats and tons of data on the product side, basketball and hockey. Do they have their own business intelligence operational structure? Do they have their own data sources? Do you share? resources and data structures, or are you very siloed? Great question. I figured I'd get that one from, uh, yeah, from the audience. So they do have their own um, uh, business intelligence group that works on the basketball side. And they work with a, you know, what I would call a proprietary set of data. And right now in sports, it's a bit of an arms race to get more information in advance of anything happening, right? You're making million dollars, million dollar decisions, and those decisions can make or break a GM's career if they make the wrong one. So they realize the importance of having a group that can advise them on making smarter decisions, and you're seeing a stronger investment and reliance on the detail that they provide. But it comes down to even the finite detail of when do you take a timeout? When do you arrest a player? What should a player eat when, when they're in a uh, travel cycle? When should they sleep? I mean, everything is so defined and regimented on that side, but that's their secret sauce. That's what separates them, because at the pro level, the, the difference in competition is very finite, right? Everybody's capable of being a great player. It's the little nuances that sit in between the inches that make the difference between the really, really good teams and the great teams. And that information is not shared amongst teams. It's very black box internal to, to what they do as quote unquote their secret sauce. Now on the business side, it's opposite. Because while we compete on the floor, we don't compete on a business to business basis. Because the way that sports is segmented from a geographical radius, we can't go into Detroit's market and try to poach a Detroit fan to be a Cavs fan or buy a ticket. So we're constantly sharing best practices on what's working in their market compared to what's working in ours and trying to evolve as a, as a sport. And that's not, you know, I know Major League Baseball's got a little bit different model and NFL has a different model, but the NBA has been very, very proactive in being able to kind of create this open environment for sharing of, uh, of information on the business side. I don't see it ever changing on the basketball side. Let me uh, just make an observation, if I could. So if you have a digital twin of the game, and you have literally maybe hundreds of thousands of fans out there that are playing the game along with you, you have the opportunity to have real-time simulation of various different scenarios of the game. And you also have the possibility of doing Monte Carlo uh, simulation of you know millions of different variations from the point in the game that you're at. So I think it's only a matter of time before coaches are going to be empowered with real-time analytics that will tell them what to do in the game, what decisions to make next. And as an illustration of that, if any one of you are Formula One fans, you know uh, just how much data is being collected during the course of a race. And they're literally doing millions of simulations of what can happen at this point forward, given everything that's happened in the race up till that moment. So the potential is fantastic. I don't know, uh, Abdu, how much more time do we have at this point? About two minutes. OK, so uh, I guess should be uh, one more question from the audience. Uh, anybody? Or uh, maybe uh, RJ, would you like to comment on anything uh, that you've heard? Or, or, or was there a question? I can't see because of the light. Oh, OK, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, I've had the pleasure of actually working with Mike and his team um, on some mixed reality stuff. So I just wanted to say you have a fantastic team. They're 
they're awesome to work with. But um, a question on the real-time data side, you, when you start to set thresholds for, say, revenue targets on beverages or whatever it may be, are you starting to see the need to create dynamic press it, the pricing once you hit those targets? Or if you're not hitting those thresholds, where that's changing within the arena? I think that's the evolution eventually. I know they're doing some dynamic pricing for concessions based upon demand right now. Um, and that one has a little bit more complexity because you're dealing with the front end change that has to happen with your concessionaire being, being Aramark. So it's another disparate system. What I will say, dynamic pricing and ticketing right now is already done, right? So is you, you start with your high yield areas and your revenue areas, and you try to figure out a way to optimize the opportunity. And that's, you know, there's a little bit of, um, you know, uh, challenge that's, I think, coming from the fan side on what dynamic pricing does to the cost of a ticket. But it's strictly driven by demand and the variables that are around that demand. So the biggest challenge in the past, I think like a lot of us that are in technology had to deal with, it was a manual process that you had to run and get your insights, then load that into another system. That system then had to be pushed to production to be able to change that stuff out. And we've got it to a point now where as our model runs and changes, we are directly piping that detail into the fields of the physical tickets that are being sold online to change the cost or the price of that based upon the demand we're seeing in real time. And that's really, really exciting, you know, but also with, with, with great opportunity <laughs> comes great responsibility to, to take a look at many different environmental factors, whether it be through the secondary market, through what we're trying to accomplish with, you know, retention. There, there's, you know, there's a lot of complexity that's in that. The F&B stuff is pretty straightforward. But because of the relationship of another third party being involved, the control becomes a little bit more challenging, if that makes sense. So thank you very much. Thank you to RJ. Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's a fantastic presentation. I think we have a thousand more questions.